This is Suzanne Wagner of the C.G. Jung Institute of Los Angeles. In the next hour, you will view a conversation I held with Dr. Marie-Louise von Franz in 1979 at her retreat in Bollingen, Switzerland. Dr. von Franz is a world-renowned Jungian analyst. She was born in 1915 to Austrian parents who moved the family to Switzerland when she was three years old. She grew up in Switzerland and it has become her home country. She earned a PhD in classical languages from the University of Zurich. In 1933, as a young student of 18, she first met Jung. This was a fateful meeting. Within a year, she began analysis with Jung and became his major research assistant in his extensive studies of alchemical texts. She contributed a great deal to two of Jung's major works, Ion and Mysterium Communionis. Her own first book, Aurora Consurgens was published in the Bollingen series and is a companion volume to Mysterium Communionis. Through the years since Jung's death in 1961, von Franz has published a large body of work and has lectured widely all over the world. Her biography of Jung, C.G. Jung, His Myth in Our Time, is a profound and brilliant illumination of the way his work emerged from his own individuation. During our visits with von Franz, she told me that Jung had encouraged her, even insisted that she build this retreat for herself away from her busy life in Zurich. To design the tower, she enlisted the services of Jung's son, Franz Jung, who is an architect. For many years, she shared this retreat with her close friend and colleague, Barbara Hanna. This conversation took place in the garden outside the tower in September of 1979. Since that time, Dr. von Franz has retired from lecturing and analytic practice. Dr. von Franz, I'd like to ask you some questions about your experiences with Jung over the many years that you worked with him. Um, in terms of his own typology, he was, um, didn't he feel that he himself was a uh, thinking intuitive? Yes. Yes, he felt he was a thinking, intuitive type. Uh -huh. So and it would have been, the inferior function would have been somewhere in the, in the feeling, yes, sensation yes, realm. Yes, And uh, that would have been where all the imps and the devils played, I suppose, well, out you of see, the unconscious. Well, you see, for me, that would be difficult to judge because I'm a thinking, intuitive <laughs> too, yourself. <laughs> so <laughs> I have also inferior feelings. Uh -huh. So if there was a clash, <laughs> you never knew quite who's in fear your feelings, but I would say in 85% of the cases I had to see that it was mine. <laughs> I see. So between the two of you, that would be a kind of dark area. In that type, it, it's difficult because in one way you get marvelously on, as long as you keep to thinking and intuition, you go, you get on completely. And then on the feeling area, you have trouble. Uh-huh. Well, I, I wonder if, if you have any anecdotes or stories about how, um, how you bumped into his shadow side or how it ever uh, upset you or you felt disappointed or... I only once really bumped into his anima and the, I came to, into the hour and admittedly was a bit in the animus but not, not much. And uh, he just started that once you are in the animus and one cannot talk to you today, wow, wow, and really shouted at me and I started to cry, which he hated, and, uh, and then I got angry and shouted back. And so we shouted at each other for quite a while, and then I went home and cried and was absolutely desperate. And the next morning, 
the secretary rang up and said, Professor Jung wants to ask you if you had a minute time to come over at 11 o'clock. And I said, naturally, and I came. And when I entered the house, he was then about 68 or 70. And you know, a big man, he stood up heavily and bowed very politely and said, I only, I'm sorry that I to ask you to come out, but I wanted to apologize. I was yesterday in the anima. I can't tell you, but something very disagreeable happened to me just before the hour, and I hadn't time to catch myself up. And so I just want, I can't tell you, unfortunately, what it is because it's private, but uh, I want to apologize. So then I felt very humble and said, it's me to ap <laughs> who has to apologize too. Mm -hmm. and then, and I must say, when I went home, I, I thought, now I have much more confidence in that man than before. Mm -hmm. Because I knew if there is a misunderstanding, and in a long relationship there is always once a misunderstanding or, you know, a clash of the negative side, he would always come round, see it at once and come round. Mm -hmm. So it really helped the relationship in the end. I was glad it happened. Mm -hmm. Because then later, when there was trouble, I always thought either it's his fault and then he'll come round, or it's my fault and then I'll have to come round, and that's all there is to it. So it gave you a sense of freedom and it gave trust. me a sense of confidence. Mm -hmm. I wondered how you, your impressions of him changed over the years. It must have been a gradual process of realizing um, how great he was, for one thing. Or did you know immediately? You I knew it? immediately that he was the greatest man I'd ever met and would probably ever meet. Mm -hmm. And the process was rather the reverse. I was so awed by him when, you know, being 18 and he 58 and a great mm. man and so on, that for a long time I had difficulty to relate to him because I was too overawed. Mm -hmm. He made me speechless. I couldn't, in a way, relate to him. I felt like a a frog looking up to an <laughs> elephant and uh, didn't dare to talk even. I mean, I had great trouble to talk openly to him. Mm -hmm. He intimidated me terribly. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I generally wrote him letters about what I thought. And when I saw him, he, I was just speechless. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I just told him my dreams and walked off again shyly. Mm -hmm. And the development was that I slowly through such incidents, as I told you before, mm -hmm. became, it became more a human relationship, I mean, and a more equal relationship, and a possibility to talk openly or not to talk, or mm -hmm. not to be so overawed mm -hmm. as I was first. Did you know uh, Emma Young very well? Did you have much contact with her? No, I, uh -huh. I didn't know her very well. She was a great friend of Miss Hannah. Uh -huh. And they got on very well together. Mm -hmm. We never had any difficulties, but I, I never came close to her, except in the last summer uh, when she was ill and she knew she was going to die. She apparently talked to her husband and they decided that I should finish her book. Oh. And one day when I went to the tower, he said to me, go over to speak to my wife. And I looked at him amazed and he said, her attitude to you has changed. Mm. And then I had a very good talk with her. She had the wish that I uh -huh. should do it. And so that then suddenly in this last moment before her death made a very positive bridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, there I had an interesting dream. I, uh, I, uh, I was very uncertain. I, I, I naturally agreed to do it. I mean, who wouldn't in mm. such a situation? But subjectively, I felt uh, I can't do all that creative work, you know. It's my, not my work. How uh -huh. can I carry out a child which somebody else has conceived? Yes. That's a transplantation. How can I do it? Mm -hmm. And I was very doubtful about it. And then I dreamt in the night. Uh, yes, I must first re tell in reality, my dog, when she, after she had been in heat, sometimes had the imagined she was going to have puppies. <laughs> and then she made holes in the ground and lay in them happily, you know, with his mother <laughs> feeling, <laughs> hoping for puppies. And uh, she did that once in Jung's tower under a bench and had made a hole there and we laughed about it. 
And in the dream, Mrs. Jung had a big bowl uh, of soup. And she said, I'm going to put that into that. And she put it in that hole which my dog made. Oh. Now, you see, uh, the soup bowl is, is one of the symbols of the grail. Oh. That was the grail. He is in one version. The grail is a soup bowl. Oh. And so it means I hand now this soup bowl, my child, to your mother instinct. As an adopted child, yes. to your dog, which is your mother instinct. Beautiful. So that is an act of ado adoption on the feminine side. You mm -hmm. see, I've adopted her childhood because she has entrusted me with yes. her child. And yes. When I woke up after the dream, I thought, now I'll probably be able to do it. Yes. My yes. unconscious has accepted the task. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about Jung's relationship with Tony Wolf when you? How did you know of it? First of all, it was just there, I guess. I knew it by gossip, I don't know. Uh -huh. I mean, he, he made no secret of it, so uh -huh. everybody knew it, and very soon, I couldn't remember the exact date, but I, very yes. soon I got into the Jungian pupil patient circle, I heard about it. Uh -huh. And uh, I actually guessed it the first time I met him, because he was with Tony Wolf in the tower. Uh -huh. And I thought, oh, that's his woman friend. Uh -huh. How do you uh, understand that, uh, his need for that kind of relationship with her? Did it have to do with the development of his work, do you think? His, or, the, or his own relationship to the deeper unconscious? You see, a man of his statue, one woman couldn't fill out all his needs for relationship. And Mrs. Jung was... He loved her very, very much, but in certain areas of his work, she didn't follow him. Mm -hmm. She didn't come along. Mm -hmm. And so when he met Tony, he was in the midst of this big crisis where he went down in the unconscious, which he tells about in his memories. Mm -hmm. And she went along there in that experiment with him. And he always said, I'll always be grateful to her that she has come along mm -hmm. with me there. Mm -hmm. That was the real reason. And the other reason is that if a man's anima needs are not fulfilled by one woman, then if he doesn't live it, uh, his unlived uh, eros goes on to the daughters and they develop a, a, a father complex. Mm -hmm. I've just seen that the other day with a case where a man uh, just, the daughter dreamt every night that he was breaking into her bedroom and raping her, which he didn't in reality, but you see there was a, a kind of unfulfilled life in him which was subterraneously, and he had uh, experiences where he realized that. He suddenly saw that his daughters began to flirt with him, uh -huh. and that terrified him. Uh -huh. And so he said he had only the choice of being either the perfect gentleman according to bourgeois standards mm -hmm. and have neurotic children and everybody would just be sorry for him that he has neurotic children mm -hmm. or to be the man at, at whom everybody can throw stones mm -hmm. but help his children not to, to become sick not to be burdened with his own not with burdens with his mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. and so he he decided to choose the latter mm -hmm. And he had many more dreams, which I don't want to tell, but dreams which very clearly told him mm -hmm. that that was fate and he had to accept it. Even You see, at the time he lived, that was still... Nowadays, it's practically fashion. Mm -hmm. But uh, in these days, it was a terrible thing, and there were a lot of people who wouldn't talk to him after that anymore. Mm. They were very, very shocked. Mm -hmm. Well, in some parts of Europe, uh, it, it, there is more of a tradition for a, for a kind of a, an inspiration, inspirational relationship with another yes, woman. Yes. I think in France it's more accepted. In France it's Always more, been. altogether more, uh, sexual views in France are much more liberal. Uh -huh. Or in China it was a quite, in the old China, uh -huh. quite officially accepted situation. It but in our culture it was a, a scandal. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be, in, at least in my own experience, so uh, common for women 
I mean, it, it seems well, that women, women are more polygamous and women are in general more monogamous. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I have seen in my practice many women who got in that conflict too. Yeah. But it's not so frequent. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about why there is that tendency in women or more um, monogamous? Is it? I think that's nature. Uh -huh. On the, on the chimpanzee gorilla level, on which we have lived once too, there's always the big strong male with a lot of females. Mm -hmm. The biological. Mm -hmm. On that level, it's a biological law. In, in um, all the years of uh, Jung's work, as, as it was developing, he did have a circle of people around him who yes. were quite closely related. Yes. And, uh, um, did he appreciate that? Did he that he had uh, loyal friends, and uh, did he find that a comfort? Because so much of what he did was groundbreaking. Oh yes, he even writes in one of his letters. I have found among my patients pupils, and, and with some, a friendship for life has developed. Mm -hmm. And they carry on my work. I mm -hmm. mean, he was full, very appreciative, was very glad not to be quite alone, you know. Mm -hmm. Such a pioneering work, one is very isolated. Mm -hmm. So if somebody was able to follow him, to come along, he, he was always very happy. Mm -hmm. He seems to have found um, not as many men who could join him. And, or is that your impression? I don't know. Oh. There were some men who followed, uh, who, with whom he had very good contact. But naturally, there was also, also a lot of trouble because you see men, especially men in the, he got better on with men in another field, mm -hmm. poets, writers, artists, and so on, because they don't compare themselves with him. Mm -hmm. They had the feeling, I am a good painter, or I am a good writer, and this is a good psychologist. But if you are in the same field, there was always jealousy. They, mm -hmm. they, compared themselves with him and then they felt crushed and inferior and then they they became nasty that was a very regular pattern you saw with many who were working in the field of psychology and psychiatry hmm. you need a certain generosity to to appreciate a great person of your same sex mm -hmm. And the devil always whispers to you, he's better, I'm better, mm -hmm. he's only that, I'm better, and the old jealousy, and then, and then they create trouble. Mm. He took great trouble to avoid that, but he, in a way, he was a crushing personality for mm -hmm. a man. Mm -hmm. You know, he did everything better. He was better in psychology, but then he painted beautifully. He, uh -huh. he could cut in stone. He, <laughs> so, so whenever you compared yourself with him, you felt uh -huh. like a louse, and that naturally created a lot of Problem. secret uh -huh. poison. Yeah. Do you think there's something of uh, that in these continued um, accusations of anti-Semitism that keep uh, surfacing even now? I mean in the history books and in the... No, I think that is mainly kept up by the Freudians ah. as a policy. Ah. Uh -huh. You see, the developments of time have made that Freudian, Freudianism has so much won out mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. and is taught at every university in every school and you have Freudians in every clinic nowadays and so on, that you can say uh, People are beginning to be a bit sick of it. I mean, it's become, it's become self-evident. Mm. I mean, there is a certain truth in, in, in what Freud has found, and that is now self-evident. Everybody knows that one can have repressed sex and, and the Oedipus complex. That's now become common knowledge. So now the development goes to discover Jung because he's still new to the masses, to, the, to mm -hmm. the majority of intellectuals and so on. And the Freudians feel the loser. They feel they are becoming, they are beginning to, to barby people, to not be mm -hmm. anymore on top. And so they keep up that libel mm -hmm. quite artificially for 
professional reasons you could even say. <laughs> and then there is, and then there is another uh, aspect, namely fear. You see, there are many people who who are terrified of the unconscious, and as Jung is a kind of advertiser of relating to the unconscious, you have to find something to shout him down. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a defense against the a defense. So it's not so much a defense against Jung, but they really, mm -hmm. if you analyze, if you look at those people who have those terrible resistances and always keep up that libel, if you, even if you prove to them, you show them all the facts, mm -hmm. and then emotionally they just go on. Mm -hmm. Yes, but mm -hmm. he was an anti-Semite somehow, anyhow. Mm -hmm. Then it's generally that. Mm -hmm. That they are afraid of their own unconscious. Mm -hmm. And... We can't find many things. Jung has lived in such a hidden life, you know. I mean, he, he has never gone into the world much or taken any attitude that they always dig up that old story that he was the president of the German society mm -hmm. and, and that that proves that he's anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. So there isn't much in his life to go on. They have to search for something. They have to search they... for something. I see. Can you say anything about how the problem of evil uh, might have constellated itself, I guess we're circling around that a little bit, in, in personal experience in, in the Jungian community in, as years went on. I mean, doesn't it constellate itself right in your own backyard? Yeah, naturally, <laughs> obviously. But <laughs> Jung's awareness of the problem of evil was not, did not spring from there. I, he, mm -hmm. would, he took very much part in what was happening in the world, mm -hmm. and he was very, very worried over the First World War, as you can mm -hmm. take out his memories in the second, and he was very terrified of the third one, or a holocaust of our, our whole culture. He seriously reckoned with that. And via that, the problem of evil has come into mm -hmm. being a major preoccupation, mm -hmm. while the the constant mischief and mm. jealousies and animus, mm -hmm. anima nonsense, that he, that he took more on his stride, you know. Mm -hmm. He didn't take that very tragically. He mm -hmm. just said, oh, <laughs> are you so infantile? And, uh, I, and all those pupils I've trained you so long and they're still just kindergarten. He just cursed it, but it didn't upset him. Mm -hmm. what, what you would call the personal shadow of people didn't upset him. He mm -hmm. just grumbled and cursed a bit, but that's not the problem of evil. It's that major evil of mm -hmm. complete destruction which worried him. Mm -hmm. And his real approach to that was the inner work yes. that he did. The yes. only thing you can do. The only thing you can do. Mm -hmm. To confront yourself with it where you are. Mm -hmm. All the rest, all the benevolent, if benevolent preaching would help, mm -hmm then we would be out of the trouble long ago because we have we get a lot of benevolent and reasonable preaching but it doesn't help so the only place where you can really put the hand on it and deal with it body to, to body the problem of evil is in yourself and there you have to the hope to change something but the hope to change the world is a, is a childish illusion Go and tell Khomeini that he is possessed. Mm -hmm. He can cut your head off for <laughs> it. That's <laughs> sex. <laughs> Seems uh, almost impossible that enough people in our time would be wise enough or courageous enough to choose the inner way with the problem of evil. It's so tempting to try to be heroic and act, yes, act yes. outwardly. Yes. For example, uh, all over the world, the, the nuclear um, weapons and the mm -hmm. nuclear power yes. that's developing. It makes me want to jump up and, and run out and spend all my time and money to try to stop the, you know, that. Well, you Rather will soon, than do the end. You'll soon run up against some obscure lobbies where you, where all your efforts get blocked. Mm -hmm. I I think one should say it aloud. Mm -hmm. One should not be a coward. One should 
make demonstrations. One should go against it, but mm -hmm. one should not waste all one's energy into it because it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. One should say one's opinion and that's all, and that's how the rest fight inwardly. Because you see, finally, it's not we who will decide that question, it is the collective unconscious which will decide, or in l religious language, God. Mm -hmm. And if you work on your own problem, then you might get into analysis a politician who has influence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you have done more mm -hmm. than if you had gone in the street with a transparent every day. Mm -hmm. And that, that you get a, an influential politician into your analysis or suddenly interested in Jungian psychology, you can't make. No. You can only work on yourself, and that mm -hmm. is the unconscious. And therefore, you say, if God wants to save the world, he will put certain, call up certain people to, to know certain things. Mm -hmm. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. It happens always as a miracle, unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. But you can go to meet that miracle by working on yourself. Mm -hmm. I left it as natural as I can. What was here when you first came? There was only a water hole as big as that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. About here, just mm -hmm. that little corner. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I dug, I had dug that out. There's a dragonfly. Mm -hmm. Do they eat some of the plants? Yes, they, they eat the little mosquitoes and things. I mean bugs and mosquitoes and these kind of things. It's very good because otherwise you would have in the autumn a lot of mosquitoes with such a pond, but they, I never have mm -hmm. any. Mm -hmm. They eat them all. So they are even useful on top of being charming. What happens to the pond in the winter? It freezes. Mm -hmm. There's probably the toad. He's always mm -hmm. resting there. There, there's one. Aren't they sweet? Oh, the beautiful. That's a toad. It, yeah. It's a toad, it's a kind of toad. It, uh, it, in German it's called Unke. Because it doesn't croak, it makes coo -coo 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 Very delicate. But you hear it very far in the woods. It's a delicate but penetrating sound. Mm -hmm. But they mostly do it in the mating time in June. Mm -hmm. But you hear them sometimes also in the evening when they are very good mood. They make coo 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 They breathe in the air? It looks as if they put their mouth up above the water. No, no, they no. can also breathe under. Oh, okay. And they even, they can stand it under the earth. When it's very dry, they go under the earth. And they survive till, till there's water again. Mm -hmm. They dig into the earth and they sleep till about uh, the warm days of April. It's always exciting in spring, you wander and you, you are the toads there, and then at the warm day, the first toad. <laughs> Every time I see one, I want to laugh. They look like little men, and there's a little one. If you come over here. Oh, see? Mm -hmm. <laughs> They are little human beings because they have such hands and feet like human <laughs> beings. <laughs> That's what's so nice about them. They are not so inhuman. They are really like little men. <laughs> Dr. von Franz, uh, can you explain the concept of the personal shadow and the collective shadow? Well, the in practical life, they emerge, but the personal shadow is the personal shortcomings of uh, things which every human being could be conscious of, which is not archetypal and therefore not a mystery. For instance, such things as greed for money or jealousy. Jealousy is one of the main <laughs> aspects of the shadow, or laziness, sloppiness, uh, 
unrelatedness, sentimentality and whatnot, inferiorities which everybody has but uh, prefers not to know about. Mm -hmm. And because we generally strive through education and through environmental pressure to be a bit better than we actually are. Or we have our own ideals. I oughtn't to be jealous. I oughtn't to have a power complex. And, but you see, for instance, that in criminals, they sometimes live their inferiority, and then they have a personal shadow which is noble. They dream about noble people, and it's just reverse. They live, so to speak, their mean side, and, and then they have a, a, a positive shadow. And therefore, even in a, what is more the average truth, the, the inferior shadow is not really bad. It's just human, all too human. Mm -hmm. And something one could know about, if one is jealous or if one is suddenly possessed by wanting money or so on, one, one, one could know about it if one is honest with oneself. But the collective shadow has to do with the dark side of the archetype of the self. That means it's the shadow of the God image. In the Christian tradition, it would be the devil. Mm -hmm. And that has always been personified and felt as something which has not to do with directly with the human being. I mean, if somebody is possessed by the devil, he's much worse than just... He's not human, it's demonic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but on the other hand, generally that merges. First you have this area of uh, dim, dark side, and behind it lurks the other. I've, for instance, seen that when Germany went to the devil in na Nazism, people fell into it through their personal shadow. For instance, they didn't want to lose their job because they were clinging to money. That was their personal shadow, but then they joined in with the Nazi movement for that reason and did much worse things than they would have done normally under normal social conditions. So you can say the personal shadow is the bridge to the collective shadow or the open door to the collective shadow, but the collective shadow comes up in those terrible mass psychoses. Well now if a person becomes more aware of then the he, personal shadow... Then that's why it's so tremendously important because then you don't fall into the collective shadow. Mm -hmm. There's not that um, automatic there's link. Not that, uh, open, it's I'd like if you have your, a room and there's one door on a trap and mm -hmm. there the devil can come in. Mm -hmm. And if you know your personal shadow you can shut all the doors. Mm -hmm. so for and example, then you don't join in into mm -hmm. massacres and holocausts and such you catch yourself and you, you can catch stop. yourself and you realize mm -hmm. that, uh, and you can keep out of it mm -hmm. and keep reasonable keep your head while the, the average person who has doesn't know about her, her personal shadow they get swept away by the collective evil mm -hmm. is it possible to speak of a shadow in terms of national identity a, a shadow in switzerland a shadow in the united states Yes, okay. naturally. Mm -hmm. The summing up of uh, every society has its ideals and lives up to those ideals mm -hmm. and has also a shadow. Mm -hmm. The average American has a typical shadow and the average Swiss has a typical shadow, which mm -hmm. is slightly different. Mm -hmm. But there again, you can say the more individuals in a nation know about their shadow, the, the better that nation is off or less likely to fall into a mass psychotic, destructive, sweeping away movement where people lose every measure, you know, I mean, just kill their relatives, kill thousands of people without even having a bad conscience about it. It's real, just madness. Mm -hmm. Is um, the analytic process um, the only way of, of coming to terms with the shadow or becoming aware of it? Are there other ways for, for individual people to I become I don't know aware. if it is the only way, but it's the only way I know. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, the, to see one's own shadow is such a painful thing that you will never do it honestly in a group. You mm -hmm. can't admit such painful little secrets. So all the official confessions people make in groups Oh, I'm jealous, or I'm childish, are uh, just words. 
the cover-up, when it comes to the really painful spots, even the analyst has to be very tactful and, and very trading on dangerous ground and looking out of the window and, you know, because it's the other is wincing under his realization of his inferiority. Mm -hmm. And so he needs a man to human being to human being situation to help the other to become aware of his shadow. Mm -hmm. And you can't do it in a big mm -hmm. sweep. It's the individual connection, though, it's that is so important. It's the individual connection which is decisive. Uh -huh. Because you can't stand your shadow when you are alone. You just collapse. Uh -huh. You need a human being to hold your hand when you go uh -huh. into that dangerous area. Uh -huh. And if there's a group, you slide out, kind of. You, you slide out or you make general. You know, like in the Oxford groups, everybody said, I'm greedy of money, I drink too much. Uh -huh. And they didn't mean it. Uh -huh. It's in the personal relationship that it becomes so awkward. Uh -huh. And then you are pinpointed, and then it becomes an indelible shock to see your own shadow. And then, then you have it, then you really know it. You can't forget it again the next morning. Well, doesn't that also happen in long-term friendships or marriages, that oh, you know, yes. you're kind of up against oh, yes. the wall, oh, faced yes. with it? All close relationships are, uh, in a way, analytical relationships. It, it is a, an, because it simply means a relationship in which both, Partners try to become conscious by exchanging mm -hmm. each other, with, with each other, sharing each other's fate. There seems to be uh, around the around marriage a kind of uh, uh, avoidance and aversion now. So divorce is so easy, and it's it's happening at least in the states that people don't stay married very long. So they. They, in a way, are they running from the shadow, do you think? They are running from either from the shadow or very often from animus and anima. That's the big complication between the sexes. Mm -hmm. If you live with somebody of the same sex, it's the shadow gets constellated. If you live with somebody of the other sex, then the bigger task comes. That's why it's the more valuable relationship, because it's the, also the bigger task. Mm -hmm. Because that constellates anima and animus. And as the average American nowadays doesn't know yet what that is. Mm -hmm. Whenever animus and anima clash, they run, run apart. It's finished. They throw it over. If they stuck it out, they would learn a lot about themselves. That doesn't mean that we are not sometimes uh, for divorce. There are situations you better think of a divorce. There are relationships where both partners become destructive to each other, mm -hmm. plainly destructive. Mm -hmm. And then it is better to, to make a, a final decision. But there are others where it's just a clash of animus and anima, and if they could become conscious, they could get on again. It seems that every place but Switzerland, the money is going up and down, up and down. It's in high inflation in the United States. Does this, and even the terms are psychological, <laughs> inflation, inflation depression, we are going to a recession, to a depression, <laughs> to a boom, to an inflation. It's all psychological, really. Take it, take it as, at the first sight, that's what it is. Uh -huh. So, but what is it that is inflating Your money us? is a symbol for the circulation, the extrovert circulation of energy. Uh -huh. And when you have a boom, then there's too much extroversion, too much consuming, too much activity going on. And then you get forced into a depression and a recession, which forces you into poverty, which means more introversion, more sacrifice, more turning to inner values. You can't afford a television. You have to amuse yourself with your own thoughts, <laughs> and so on. So you can, just, uh, you can just read those papers with a psychological eye, and you see what's happening. What is it about Switzerland that makes it so solid here in terms of the money? I think that's because we escaped two wars and therefore we have more contin traditional continuity. Mm -hmm. You see, wars mix a population up completely, uproot them, a whole generation of men disappears, uh, the next generation of men is brought up by widowed mothers and then there are enormous transplantations of for instance, in Germany, all the Germans we were, who were east of the Iron Curtains flooded into Western Germany, married Western Germans, 
and so on. They have no roots, they have no love to the village. They settled in a village because they got a job there. But they don't love the village, they, and so on. So that makes for a rootless uh, population. And a rootless population looks for only what they have before their nose. A good job, money, a flat, schools for the children to bring them up. That's A, B, C. Naturally, I would do the same thing. I mean, if you are thrown out of your country, that's what you look for in the other country. And that destroys all human relationships, be the grandmother, the grandfather, the aunts being together, knowing the village, everybody knew you when you were a little child, you are contained in a family. If you lose your father or mother, the whole neighbors come together and help you, and they knew your father and mother, and so on. All these ties are broken. Mm -hmm. And we need continuity, historical continuity, and the more the population can have a, a time of long historical continuity, the more they get balanced. Because you see, I see it up here, how things regulate themselves. When I came up here, my neighbor, who has died now, who sold me the land, said, look here, up here in Moos, we are a little family. We quarrel all, we hate each other. He didn't talk to his own neighbor, never, they didn't greet each other. But we never go too far. Because if we are stuck in the snow with the car, we have to have to help each other out. You wouldn't help me out, wouldn't you? I said, yes, I would. So he said, you see, so you see, for instance, one peasant cuts a tree across the border of the other peasant. He doesn't make a lawsuit. Hmm. He smiles, and he cuts also a tree on the other side <laughs> of the border. And then they meet again in the inn, and they have a little grin at each other. And that's all there is. And so the shadow is balanced out. Mm -hmm. And you don't call the state in and the whole injustice of so-called justice. Mm -hmm. It's all settled on human level. And everybody knows everybody's shadow and says, don't, don't tell that lady that and that, you know she is and so and so. Gossip is a form of low kind of psychological analysis of each other, you see. Uh -huh. And so everybody's contained. And now I feel first I was the, the foreign queer lady here with a funny house, <laughs> but now that I'm here for a long time, the peasants come to me and talk pair, we, we the Bollingen people, don't want Jonah to do that and that. I belong. Uh -huh. and that makes me very happy. Uh -huh. And Switzerland has and had Switzerland a long has history. has not much yet. It has also big towns, and there we have all the troubles we have in the world. Mm -hmm. But we have still big areas of little towns and villages where the great-grand-great-grandfather is buried in the churchyard mm -hmm. and where people just follow on the rhythm of the past and are contained in, in a natural community. There must be something, though, in the psychology of the Swiss, not just the geography, that has allowed this introverted introversion of war, as Miss Hannah once put yes. it, that, so that war isn't acted out. Well, I don't think we are better. It is just, uh, we are so small mm -hmm. that we can't act out war. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't attack you Germany or France or Italy. We are the smallest. And therefore, we, we have to defend. We are like a hedgehog. We def the, the Nazis called us the hedgehog. They were going to pick up at the end, as they sang. Uh, we, we just try to defend our little country and we can't afford exploding with our shadow against the others. We, we would nicely get it if we did. Mm -hmm. if, so we have a shadow, we can't explode outside, so that has finally made us reasonable <laughs> to look at our own shadow. It's the same as a neurotic patient. Generally, he only comes in analysis to look at his shadow when he has quarreled with his whole surrounding so badly <laughs> that he has to. <laughs> <laughs> then he, he said, my God, uh, perhaps it's me, let's look at it. <laughs> and that's uh, how it go, it's gone with us. Mm -hmm. And then slowly the Swiss got reasonable and realized the advantage of it and made it an institution. Our democracy is an institution of, of quarreling with each other on the basis of certain legal limitations. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a constant hot, not cold, but hot war among each other. Mm -hmm. 
but we are respecting certain fair play rules where it could get too bad. Well, do you think that the big, big powers in the world, like the United States and Russia, are are learning their limitations now uh, at all? I think that might, that is my hope, uh. that they get into the same situation that they can't afford the war anymore, uh -huh. and therefore get confined to their own borders. borders. And if they are confined to their own borders, then they will have to confront themselves with their inner difficulties. Because what's wrong with in their own country? Mm -hmm. So uh, the I Russians will have to look at their dissidents and take them a bit more seriously. And America will have to look at uh, their uh, commercial dealings, which are a bit too rough, mm -hmm. and, and look at, uh, at the shadow there. Mm -hmm. In that case, a depression might be the beginning of a, of a healing oh, process. Oh, yes, certainly. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a great advantage. Mm -hmm. A depression is a blessing of God. I mean, in the individual, it's the greatest blessing somebody can have. Mm -hmm. Not used to looking at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, always talked about the blessing of a neurosis, <laughs> because it's the only way you, you are tempted to look within. As long as things go out well, you, you run away from yourself. Or most people do. Do you think his work um, uh, can have its effect without the analytic process? Uh, there is the idea floating around that analysis is a form that might end it's, it's something that grew up in the 19th, 20th century, and it might, might not go on as a way of doing things, the analytic process itself. I don't believe I that. I think if one, if one takes the analytic process as certain young pupils take it, as a whole technique and an encounter with uh, certain payment regulations and all mm -hmm. these technicalities, transference, counter-transference, that, uh, that's all nonsense, but that was never what Jung meant. For, for Jung, analysis was a spontaneous encounter of two human beings. And I think that will always happen. Mm -hmm. Because you, see, you look in the Far East, the real wisdom has always been transmitted from master to pupil. That means always from human being to single human being. It's the only way to really transmit something. But there's usually a container of some kind, a form that holds you together. I think it's that will just vary. Uh -huh. It will just be different. Yeah. I don't know what form it might take or uh -huh. not take. I mean. Uh -huh. And then certainly uh, many of the ideas Jung expressed are what one would call in the air, and people yeah. find them independently of no, without knowing Jung or reading Jung. They by looking into themselves, come to the same conclusions. So to my idea, there are uh, thousands of Jungians in the whole world who have never heard the word Jung, but to me, they are Jungians, mm -hmm. because they are based on the same experience and the same inner truth. They give it different names, and that doesn't matter. You, you can't really say that Jung's work represents just science, or science in the old sense, or that it's, it's not a religion, and yet, what is it I itself, the work that he did? Doesn't it somewhere live uh, on the border between those it's two? It's certainly beyond science, if you take science in the sense of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. It's not a hard science. Mm -hmm. It's partly a hard science. I mean, the, the doctor doctrine, let's call it, or the hypothesis of the archetype and mm -hmm. these things, you can really prove with hard science. With hard research. Mm -hmm. With hard research yeah. and you can anybody put it under everybody's nose and you can make experiments with it and so on. So there is a bit of hard science in it. Mm -hmm. Then there is an art, because analysis is an art, is a skill. It depends on the personality, on, on the spontaneity of the personality. I would say that's much more something artistic or generally human. 
and then you can say, it, if you want the definition, I would say the closest to it is something like uh, the original Taoism in China, a kind of wisdom. Uh -huh. Not the Taoism who later became schools and, you know, techniques, but, but in the Lao Tse and Chuang Tse and so such people. That was a wisdom which has infinitely influenced China without having definite techniques. Mm -hmm. And I see Jungian psychology more parallel to that a bit. And that's why it's not a it's not a religion and it's not a science. If you want a word, I mean I don't like words, but if you want <laughs> to pin a word on it, I would say a kind of wisdom. In most of the world religions, there are forms of worship and prayer and celebration which are group or extroverted mm -hmm. in nature. They're not introverted. Yes. Something a ritual or something. A ritual. Yes, yes I would say uh, wherever there is a deep archetypal experience, which is always a, also an emotional experience, there is a spontaneous need for acting it out. And in a way, that is a ritual. And if uh, congenial people are together, it can happen that it becomes a group ritual, that something is done, one does together. But if you organize it, the great danger is that then people come in who are not in the congenial mood. They had just an annoying letter before they, at home before they joined, or something. Mm -hmm. Or they are just in a sober mood and not... They're not so into it. They are not into it. And then it becomes a formalism and a dishonest gesture. And that is the death of all ritual. And that, that's uh, what makes religions die, that their rituals and prayers and gestures always become mechanical mm -hmm. and done by people who don't feel them anymore, mm -hmm. more and more and more. And that's the great danger. That's why you prefer to leave it to the spontaneous happenings. The hippies' meetings where they just waited for happenings mm -hmm. was close was close to something real. Mm -hmm. That was quite good. One should be, if anything, I would say one should keep it to such a, in such a form. <laughs> to come sometimes together and wait for spontaneous happenings. Uh -huh. What about, have you ever seen an American Indian dance? Yes. The whole village participates and they have this long process of preparation. As a way, I think, maybe of bringing each person into it. Yes, I haven't been there, but I've read quite a lot about it. And my impression is that that is really genuine. That's not a formalism. That's a, a genuine and living expression of an archetype. Mm -hmm. But you hear already now that if Indian children have gone to school and have been indoctrinated by white man's nonsense, they can't participate anymore. Uh -huh. They don't get back into the mood. Uh -huh. So that means as long as you are in it, it's all right, but you can't, it's very difficult to find your way into it again once your uh, rationalism has thrown you out. Yes. And that's, uh, that's why I don't know if unions who are not, who come generally from having had a neurosis and having been indoctrinated by rational school education, if they can do it genuinely. Uh -huh. I have wondered if there isn't something, for example, what happened in, in uh, Germany, uh, because there was such a sweeping uh, over of the culture and a kind of um, falling into yes. uh, ecstasy almost. Yes. That was a genuine religious phenomenon, but with, in a negative form. In a negative form. In a neg you see, that's the danger. When it happens collectively, it generally slips off into, into the negative. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Jones. It slips off into unconsciousness and letting oneself go into emotions, losing self-control. While, for instance, those Indian dances, though they are ecstatic, are highly formally controlled. Oh, yes. They are highly formed, yes. and not just a bleh, letting out one's emotions and falling into them. And you see, religions have a huge shadow. I mean, the Islam who went around and right to the doors of Vienna, 
beheading everybody who didn't worship Allah, and so on. These are these emotional religions who are just mass movements, and they are not, not necessarily something ideal. They are just the archetype sweeping people away. You can say the ones who are in it enjoy it, and the ones who are out of it pay the bill. If you don't worship Allah, head off. I remember reading about Max Zeller's dream that uh, he was, in working with the inner life, he was building uh, on a temple that would take hundreds of years to be built, and Jung called him back after an hour to speak about this dream. And he said, you know how long it will take for the temple? Mm. 600 mm. years. Well, that image uh, is uh, quite a powerful one, as if all this individual work is building a temple. Yes, I think that's what I meant when I said before there are thousands of Jungians who have never heard the name Jung. All the people who are honestly working on their own inner problem in their own way are builders of a new temple, and it takes 600 years because that means it takes as long till we are fully in the Aquarian age. Mm -hmm. And then it will probably come out what was building itself up. But one must not want it with one's mind or head, or mm. want to organize it. <laughs> one must let that happen. That's a dream which would compensate feeling a bit lonely, feeling a bit an outsider. And the conscious says to him, no, no. Do your own job, and you are one of the builders. Uh -huh. Hermes Trismegistus said in, in one active imagination to an alchemist, I am the friend of whoever is lonely. The unconscious doesn't speak to you when you are with people. Your attention goes to the people. Mm -hmm. Well, when you are lonely, I've lived in this tower sometimes three weeks alone without speaking to one word to anybody. And I sometimes thought I was going off my head. But the unconscious became alive. Mm -hmm. It was my partner. And that's why you have to be lonely, so that the unconscious becomes stronger. You, it's like loading up the unconscious, and then it manifests. Mm -hmm. And then you are not lonely anymore. So we have to support the unconscious. It's not enough to, to just have it. We have to actively turn towards it and support it, so that it then helps us. Mm -hmm.